everyone. Welcome to, this is actually Tim Hortons, but uh, <laughs> tonight is uh, Roy's journey, the journalism of engagement. Uh, sort of two journeys, Paul's journey and Roy's journey. Uh, my name is Alan Thompson. I teach journalism here at Carleton and run something called the Center for Media and Transitional Societies, which does a lot of things. It, it primarily sends some of our students to the developing world on journalism internships but we also hold uh, events like this one. So uh, I'll briefly introduce our two speakers, but I know you're here to uh, listen to them and not to me. Uh, Paul Watson, who is probably known to most of you, uh, is a Toronto Star journalist, reporter, conflict reporter, war correspondent. Uh, Paul's a, a career journalist, a career sort of dreamer, idealist, we knew each other at the Star when Paul was uh, basically demonstrating to the Star that we could cover Africa by using his holidays to go there. <laughs> and then they would buy the stories from him. And they finally had the good sense to open an Africa Bureau and sent Paul as the Toronto Star's uh, first Africa Bureau team. And he did a lot of fantastic work, won Canada's, I think, still only Pulitzer Prize for a Canadian journalist for a famous photograph that he took and went on to all kinds of great things, left the star for a while, went to the Los Angeles Times, covered many other parts of the world. Got recently, fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. Recently returned uh, to the Toronto Star, where he's created one of the most unique bureau assignments, I think, in the world of covering the Canadian North and covering Afghanistan and Syria and other places in between. So he's really a remarkable Canadian journalistic voice. And I get the sense is sort of at that point in his career where he's kind of decided, now I know some, there's some other things I want to do with my journalism. I'm tired of the old conventional notion about what a journalist is supposed to do. And so I'm going to do it this way. And we kind of dubbed it the journalism of engagement. And I'll let Paul uh, talk about that. And I don't know a lot about Roya, and I'm counting on Paul and Roya to properly introduce us to her story, because these two stories uh, intersect. What I know is what Paul's written, how they met in Afghanistan, uh, how Roya had great aspirations to become a politician, which sort of surprised Paul when they first met a couple of years ago, that that was her career ambition. And in the end, uh, this kind of remarkable relationship evolved for a journalist and a subject. Roy started off being a subject of interviews and a story that the star had imagined and ends up becoming a very different relationship and one where Paul's very personally involved in helping Roya to come to Canada and study and, and move on with whatever the next stage of her life is going to be. So it's, it's really a unique journey that both of them are on. So uh, it's fantastic that they can be here and we can hear from both of you. Uh, it's a very informal sort of setting. That's why we have you sitting down rather than at a podium. So I know you've got some pictures to sort of guide us through it. So why don't I just turn this over uh, to Paul initially, and then the two of you will figure out what we're going to do with the rest of the evening. And at some point, when you're tired of talking, uh, we do have a microphone, and we'll ask, we'll invite people to come and pose questions to either uh, Roya or Paul. Okay, so. Thank you, Paul. Um, before I get into the start of the story, the, I remind myself and everyone in the audience whenever we speak to people that this started as me and Roya and her family, and it's grown almost by the day into a much larger family. And there are members of that family here tonight, Sarah and her family, who were the first people in Ottawa to take Roya in, at a time which you'll hear in more detail was an incredibly difficult time. She had just come literally from the grave of her father in Kandahar to a, you know, a country she knew nothing about, into a freedom she didn't completely understand, and they kept her going through some very tough times. The headmaster of Ashbury, Tam Matthews, is here, the school nurse, Tui Noonan. These are all people, and they number into the, I think into the thousands at this point, people who are part of a family. So I welcome you all to that family too. Um, 
like any family, we laugh together, we cry together, we sometimes argue, but we all share the same goal, and that is to keep Raya rising, because that's, you'll reach this conclusion yourself if you haven't already. She has more potential than, than any young woman I've ever met, and we want to make sure that um, the simple accident of fate that she was born in a place called Kandahar in a troubled country called Afghanistan doesn't keep her from from realizing her potential. Um, and if I you know if I get all teary eyed, I'm old and getting weepy, but forgive me. Uh, Roya's journey starts in Kandahar, and although after Canadian combat forces left, it's largely fallen out of the Canadian news, both, both television and print. I can tell you that the Taliban have not gone away. They are as probably as strong as ever, even though the Canadian forces and then the American troops that took over the areas the Canadians vacated have done a good job of trying to clear out their leadership. They're still there in large numbers. They effectively have the city of Kandahar surrounded. They control large parts of the countryside there was just a, an attack on Afghan National Army forces yesterday, I think it was, in the far north of the country, in places where people wouldn't normally expect to find the Taliban. So the, the future of Afghanistan, uh, when the last American tro combat troops leave next year, is not a bright one. And it's, um, you know, uh, Roya's brother has joined us from Afghanistan, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying, um, he's, a, he's a surgeon in a government hospital, works on a very small salary, and every day has to deal with the casualties of this conflict. And he has gone through more than, than I can imagine, and I've seen a lot. He himself was attacked by the Taliban just a month ago. So this is, this is a country that's on the brink of a very difficult period all over again. It hasn't escaped war in, in 34 years, and it looks like it's just going to get worse. Uh, sorry, I, thank you. I promised I wouldn't do that. Here I was watching my own slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I can't even remember the year it was. I think it was, two, it was when I was still working for the Los Angeles Times, so it was probably 2000 nine or early 2010, um, through a very difficult operation, negotiated with the Taliban leadership of, you know, sort of a, a portion of the leadership in Pakistan to uh, meet them in Ghazni province, which is a very strategic place close to Kabul, from which they continued to launch attacks um, to see if they would allow me to visit them. And they said, well, you're free to visit us, but we can't guarantee your security between Kabul and Ghazni province where we are and the you know there's all sorts of other people who claim to be Taliban there who would easily kidnap you and uh, you've probably heard stories of other journalists uh, going through the same thing e eventually they said okay we'll we'll work something out and they got me in there for one day and I can tell you these are not people living in caves they are not um, you know I, I met the Taliban first in 1996 when they were mostly illiterate um, people who'd come from madrasas or Quranic schools in Pakistan, and uh, you know the they had some popular support but not much. The the people that I met in this group, um, you can see you, you know they covered their faces for security reasons, but they're much a much younger group. But they're a much more world savvy group. In this house where they finally took me way out in the countryside, and we're driving along roads that are patrolled by American helicopters and all sorts of things, and they're communicating on handheld radios. Um, they had Al Jazeera on satellite TV in the next room. They knew more about that day's news than I did. This is a sophisticated bunch of people who, who think they have won the war already, and they have an agenda which, although, you know, th this group, of, I don't know how representative they are of the broader leadership, their agenda is still against people like Roy. Young women who think, as her father did, that women should be equal to men. This is the 21st century. These are 
These are young men who watch Al Jazeera TV, but they still think Roya shouldn't go to school. understand, uh, you know, the, as a journalist, this drives me up the wall. And, you know, Alan mentioned that I've reached a point in my career. I think I don't have to go to places like Syria anymore, and I don't really know, or Afghanistan for that matter. The, the company would rather I didn't because they have to spend a lot of money on insurance, and there's no better way to ruin an editor's day than for her to find out you're dead, and she has to figure out how to get your body home. So they would rather it just, you know, we just sort of ignored it. But when I get letters like this, this was after the Taliban visit from a, a fine officer, I'm sure, named Ra Major Randy Schmeling, the PMTP team chief in Ghazni province, an American officer. Um, he says, these fighters, in, in quotation marks, you joyfully embedded with, are bent on killing not just as many Americans as they can, but any person who dares breathe a word against them, fair enough. I, I don't argue with that. They are not to be revered, understood, taken seriously, or given a legitimate platform from which to preach their murderous doctrine. That's a, you know, that's a military officer who says, we don't need to try to understand the enemy. Any of you who are old enough or have, have read the histories of the Vietnam War will <coughs> We'll hear that one like a ghost from a dark past. We need to understand the enemy. And part of, part of what I like about Roya and her family is that despite the risks that they take, and this is day in and day out, it's not something that disappears and comes, comes and goes, it is constant. They still love their country, and they still think that all Afghans have to get together and to sort this out. That's a, a, you know, a, a flickering flame, to use that tired uh, cliche. If, if we can keep it alive in Roya and in her brother and in other members of her family, it can spread. And there's hope for that country. And that's what, um, to me, Roya's story is about. Uh, you may, if you can advance it, I'll, I'll point. And you can, no? can you go to the next one? There we go. The, you know, the life of Roy will tell you in more detail, the life of children in Afghanistan, despite the many hundreds of billions of dollars that we've spent there, is, is horrifyingly sad. The, you know, you'll hear soon that Roy is, was a teacher herself um, we, you know, we spent a lot of time and money trying to build up the school system in Afghanistan, and we read in the newspaper that X number of dollars have been spent on schools and training teachers, and we think that means something that we understand, but really what it means is that there are buildings, and some of them are still schools, a lot of them aren't. They're either bases for the military or the Taliban have blown them up. The people who are teaching, in large cases, are students themselves, people who just graduated who then turn around and stand at the front of the class and teach because there's no other teacher there. The, when it came time for me to make a choice, do you, do, you, do you help someone like Roy or you don't, the first thing that was in my mind was that we sent troops over to Afghanistan to accomplish a mission. And that mission, as I understood it, was to support the people who, who were fighting for the similar values that we are, equality, democracy, a more liberal view of the world, a more modern view of the world. And when I had to decide, do I, do I act or don't I, the first question I came to was, if, if I don't act, then what was this all for? The, the number of Canadians who died in Afghanistan, the, the number, uh, if, is that advanced? I have to jump ahead here. Here we go. 158 dead. Uh, 
four Canadian civilians killed, one of whom was a journalist from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, people in the audience will remember her name. It escapes me. That's right. I, you know, hate me for forgetting it. Um, you know, these are all people who died for something. Editors will always tell you no story is worth dying for. Nonsense. If, if no story is worth dying for, then what the hell are we there trying to do? They, those people didn't die for nothing. And in order to keep what they died for, that hope alive, we, we help people like Roy. Because the real answer, in my mind, is to empower Afghans to solve this problem. The, the number of weapons in Afghanistan is overwhelming. Even if you started, you know, midway through this last 10 years of conflict, you know, after the 2001 intervention, and stop there, there'd be too many guns. But what we have managed to do is pour massive amounts of weapons into a country which has no stability at all, um, which gives me the fear that if things start to collapse again as troops withdraw in 2014, it could well be worse than it was when we arrived in 2001. There's better weapons, better training, people are gonna be better at killing each other is the sad reality. I don't guarantee that that's going to happen, but it's a very high possibility. Uh, a girl shall lead. That's, that's how I knew this young woman. Um, the, when I first met her in the Afghan Canadian School, uh, Afghan Canadian Community Center in Kandahar. I went there in uh, late 2010 because an editor had an idea and the idea was go find uh, a young Afghan woman who we can follow for as many years as we possibly can until she's 60 if we can and tell the unfolding story of Afghanistan's future through the eyes of that young woman for better or worse no matter what happens she'll be our focus and that's how we'll follow the story and for for someone who has difficulty um, you know, getting people far away, Canadian readers, to care about and to, to see and understand and to feel a place so remote and so alien to most of us, I thought that's an excellent idea. People will really relate and come to know this one person. But how do you find that one person? The fix, we, I work with the people we call in the business fixers. They're local um, interpreters who know things that we don't. And I said to them, I need to find a young Afghan woman. Where do I go? to find someone who, whose family will allow a foreign male to talk to her at regular intervals, um, someone who's intelligent and, and ambitious. And he said, well, why don't you go to the Afghan Canadian Community Center? I'd never heard of it before. It turns out it's funded by um, Ottawa area residents. Um, there may be people in this room. I met one, in fact, um, uh, who showed me a photograph of himself at the Afghan Canadian Center just a couple of years ago. It's a link that we had to Kandahar that I never knew of until I went there. I met the director of the school and I explained what I needed to do. He said, I have just the girl for you, come back tomorrow. The next morning I came back and there was Roya with her mother. Uh, that, 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 by the way, is the director of the school on his headphones. They do a lot of distant, distance learning. Roya can tell you about this over Skype with teachers in Canada. Um, you know, Roya had a Canadian teacher before I ever met her, who I, th I think she, you still communicate with her? Uh, yeah. yeah. We do communicate by Skype, so like it was different program that they were running like uh, United Civics and it was e-school, which I really appreciate. I get my first hand from e-school that I finished Civics. Civics, um, you know, think about that. Roya knows more about the parliamentary system than I do because she studied Canadian c civics over Skype from a, from a dusty little room in Kandahar. Um, you know, just, the, I will say this many times and forgive me for it, but, but just think of the power of people still in that room today, by the way, who aren't giving up and yet the world will give up on Afghanistan, I fear. It did once, 
and then we got 2001. And I fear that it's going to do it again. And we, you know, God knows what will happen um, 10 years hence. Uh, that again is the brave director who, you know, who has defied innumerable death threats to keep the school open. When, when I first met Roy at the school, I, I was quickly sort of going through the standard interview and asked her the obvious question, what do you want to do when you finish school? And I expected her to say to be a teacher or you know a nurse, maybe a doctor, sort of the traditional, pardon me, female answers. Um, but she said, I want to be a politician. And I, th I, thought I, I thought the interpreter had translated improperly. And I said, could you get her to say that again, please? And she said, I want to be a politician. And her mother was sitting there. And I said, I said, ask her mother, does, does she know what Roy wants to be? <laughs> um, you know, the, I make light of this, but forgive me, Roy, politicians get killed all the time in Afghanistan. The, there is no more dangerous undertaking in the country of Afghanistan than being a politician. And I asked her mother, you know, is that a dangerous thing to want your daughter to, or to allow your daughter to be? She said, I, I know, it's, it was to her, it was like, not news to me. And she told the story of Roya and her father, and how when Roya was yay high, um, her father came home, and he was a police officer from a young age, and you know he married Roya's mother at age 13, by the way, um, and treated her, uh, you know, I believe you told me, correct me if I'm wrong, um, he told your mother, you must finish school before you have children. To, to tell them how revolutionary that idea was. So the idea was like it's really hard in Afghanistan circumstances to let your like a person you got married to let them to go to school again and start again. So it was really fortunate that my father allowed my mom to finish the school. However, he she was responsible for the home and children and everything. But it was really I'm really happy like that my mother got to finish the school. However, he was she got married. Um, to correct my story, my memory if I'm wrong, but I, they told me the story that when Roy was yay high, her father came home and put his police cap on the, you know, like a coffee table or a table in the sitting room, and she toddled over and picked it up and put it on her head. Yeah. T tell the story. Uh, yeah, so it was like, I really interested while my father was getting home, like as, as usual child, that when they said their parents, they were like, okay, I have to go run, and when I was seeing my father that's coming with a Hat and I was really excited to see the uniform and the hat that he had on. And I suddenly go and just tag and grab the, uh, the hat that my father had and put on my head. And my mom was like, what are you doing? Like, at least let him to come inside home and just go and grab the hat <laughs> and put in your head. I was, like, I can't wait till he was coming home and I can put the hat on my head. <laughs> um. And this is the most important part of the story. This is Roy's father, by the way. Um, they told me about how, you know, this is, this is in the Soviet period, I think, um, long before, uh, you know, foreign troops got there, certainly in 2001, um, that he had the attitude that his daughters were equal to his sons. And that he used to come home and uh, after work at night would take the girls and the boys on the floor and teach them all how to read. He wanted to make sure that his daughters were literate. These are, these were, these are revolutionary ideas among most Afghans today, let alone when Roy was this high. And what struck me as they told me these stories was that no foreigner told him to think this way. He thought that way because he thought that was the right way to think. And, you know, the, there's only so much people from outside of any country can do. It's sort of like a family. If we want to talk about Canadian problems, if it's the oil sands or Quebec or whatever it is, we can have that argument among ourselves. But don't let the Europeans bring it up. How dare they? Um, the same is true to me for Afghanistan. I can have difficulties with the way women are treated and all those sorts of things, but I, I hate to say it, it's just not a lot of my business. But if there are Afghans 
who disagree with the way women are treated and want to fix that, I want to help those Afghans solve that problem because that's going to be a long-term solution. If we try to force a, a solution from outside by killing people or building schools or doing whatever we're doing without sufficient support inside, I, I don't see it working. Roya's father had started that fight long before any foreigners got there to pick it up. Um, I got an email from the school director one day, I can't remember when it was, but it was some weeks after what I'm about to describe. Um, it, it said very briefly, have you heard Roya's father is dead? And I thought, geez, what, you know, what happened? Was it, was it an illness? Was he killed? I didn't know. So I phoned, I emailed Roya, and I, I, and I said, you know, we got on the phone somehow on Skype. And, you know, Roy is a very, as you, you'll, you'll hear more of, is a very articulate, intelligent person. I couldn't understand a word she was saying. And I kept trying to understand, and I said, Roy, this is not working. Let me get the fixer to call you, and he'll write down everything and then email it to me. Um, he then told me the story, if you don't mind, Roy, um, the, the story of how your father was killed. Do you mind? I'll, I'll tell it. Uh, it's, it's very brief. Her, her father was a, a commander in District 1 in Kandahar City. Uh, he's a career police officer. And he led from the front. Um, you know, a lot of bad things are said about the police in Afghanistan. This was a brave man who led from the front. He was on a mission to arrest a notorious Taliban commander who was moving around the city and organizing um, IED, you know, improvised explosive device squads and assassination squads, and he was a nasty character, and as long as he was out there, uh, they weren't gonna solve the IEDs and kidnappings and other things in the city. Um, he had, they had intelligence on where they thought this guy was, and Afghanistan, or Kandahar is an old city. The, the older parts of it are these you know, narrow streets that wind, you know, Warren-like, and the, Roya recalled to me that she had phoned her father the morning, it was a nighttime operation, and the sun was rising and she said, uh, when are you coming home? Breakfast is ready. And he said, I'll be right there. There's just one more place we have to check. They thought that they, this guy had gotten away, and some people stopped them and said, why don't you check that compound down an alleyway? And so they went there, it was an animal. The, and the Taliban commander was there with a couple of his men. They hit them with hand grenades as they walked into the compound and opened fire, and Roya's father was struck, and then his men killed the Taliban commander, and they both effectively um, you know, died uh, on the spot. Um, uh, you know, the, this was not just a father. This, this was a man who had made Roy a, the strong person that she is. So when he was gone, it was clear that she had, had completely lost, at that moment, the strength that she had. She was distraught, she didn't know how she was gonna finish school, she didn't know how she was gonna do anything. Um, you will tell them, I hope, um, what was your situation after your father died? Yeah, so as, um, I would like to say that I was 16 when I first met uh, Mr. Paul. And my dreams was in Afghanistan circumstance that I would you like to be a politician. It was a totally different situation that for a woman to be in this age and go out for what he what she dreams for. So it was really difficult before that my father was alive I had the opportunity to get education and change life for Afghans. Afghans have this strength, this power to stand for their rights and if they are women and men, they want peace. They, are, they want really peace. Their points of life is like to have peace. But the problem with uh, they have least education standards, they don't have such a facilities for their young generation to go and get this peace and to have education and well-trained people to lead the country. So it was one of my dreams to be a big change for Afghans and Afghan women and Afghan society. So before I had the strength and power because my father was alive, the person who's going to give me all these opportunities and kind of her situation under this hard circumstances. So after my father passed away, 
uh, it was really difficult for me. I was stuck at home and I don't know what to do, where to go, and how can I achieve this dream in Kandahar situation. So I got trades and my family got the trades and I received some calls that I can't continue anymore what I want. For like six, five months I was at home and I can't go out of the home and finally that Ehsan uh, Allah Ehsan Afghan Canadian Community Center contacted uh, Mr. Paul and said that you know the person that you wrote the story and you want to follow <laughs> for the future as uh, like stuck at home and she can't go and get complete her education. So finally I received the email and call, which is connection in Kandahar is not really well. So the Kandahar call, I didn't get what like the main point is. So I directly emailed and then I got the email received and the process start that this process helps me to be here and start like to go through toward my dreams and achieve what I want to be. Now here, here's where we get into the title of tonight's um, session, talk, chat, meeting. Um, the, the, first, the first decision as a journalist was, do I do anything? And you know, I learned on this very campus, God, it must be 30 years ago to this day, journalists don't get involved. We're not part of the story, and you're supposed to be the objective observer and let the experts, the charity workers, and the NGOs, and the professionals deal with the solutions, you just observe. And I thought, well, if I just sit here and observe and write a story about it, nothing's gonna happen. And if I walk away from Roya at this point, I'm abandoning what her father believed in, and what Canada invested so much into, and what, what Roya believes in, and and I can, I can try to keep that alive, or I can walk away from it. So I thought, if, I, if memory serves, it was a Sunday. And I've never ever, you know, I'm the sort who says, you know, sorry, you got a problem, I can't really help you. And I'm just not the, I'm not the charitable type. But something moved me. I think it's Roya's father's spirit. I'm not a religious person. But I honestly believe something forced me to do the, to make the decision I made, and it was a, I'm certain it was a Sunday because I was shocked at how quickly the email that I wrote got an answer. Um, I quickly Googled. Uh, I thought, okay, if I if she's got to come to Canada, and we've got to get her into a school, but she can't live with me because I travel all the time, and you know that's this just isn't going to work. So I got to have to get her into a boarding school. So I literally Googled Canada boarding school, and I said, she, you know, I knew she had to learn English uh, to get her English skills up in order to succeed in a Canadian school. So I literally Googled Canada boarding school in English, and sure enough, a list came up for you know people who were shopping for schools in Canada, foreign students, and I took the the top five that sounded good, um, and I emailed all of them, and. Only one replied, and it was on a Sunday, and it was the then admissions director of Ashbury College, a guy named Kevin Farrell. And, you know, the, is he here tonight? No. Um, till, the, you know, till the day I die, I will wonder what moved that guy to answer my email. But he did, and he said, you know, I gave him some links to some stories, and he said, I've read them, and I can't make any guarantees, I'm just the admissions uh, you know, director, but I'll, I'll do everything I can to make this happen. Just, you know, the, I'm gonna get started and stick with me. And, you know, he moved mountains, he made it happen. And, you know, when, that was, that was really the hardest part. It was easy for me to say, let's do something. It was hard for somebody to make it happen. He made it happen. And then when he got there, the, the, you know, the headmaster of Ashbury, you know, the, teachers at Ashbury, they all could have said in the first month or two, Roy will tell you herself, it was difficult. She was traumatized. She was, she had culture shock. You know, she had problems with, with English language. All of those things were piling on all at once. She was worried mostly about her, you know, her family. She was up all night long, Sarah often told me, trying to communicate with her family to make sure they were not, you know, they were not injured or, or et cetera. 
All of those things were piling on, but none of the staff at Ashbury gave up on her. And they got her through a very tough period, and then she started to get traction. And, you know, just, just wait until you hear how much traction she's got. Uh, if, if she doesn't lead Afghanistan, she'll probably lead Canada. You know, th this, this was Roya in, when did you come here again? I can't even remember the dates anymore. Uh, it was July 15th. No, uh, that, that's when your father died. No, no, but, June. Uh, she arrived in January, January. Yeah. January of 2011. Uh, 11, yes. I'm 12, sure. 2012, you see it sounds like a, a decade ago. January of 2012, so that's just over a year ago. Hard to believe. That's just over a year ago. That's Roya with her mother and her sister at her, at her father's grave in Kandahar. I can't believe it's just over a year ago. Uh, th this is Roya just over a year ago at the airport uh, in Kandahar. Um, you know, the, it's hard for, for probably all of us to understand this. Um, her family had to trust me in a, in a way you can't imagine. A, you know, A, I'm not a Muslim, uh, B, I'm a foreigner, they know very little about me. Uh, I arrived with the editor of the Toronto Star, Michael Cook, who can be a frightening person. Um, but they trusted us to take care of their Roy. And there is no more sacred trust than to give your child to a stranger and say, protect her, don't let her, you know, Keep her who she, you know, keep her whole. And they trusted us to do that. And, you know, as the family grew, more people took on that responsibility. And, you know, just take a look on this, uh, this I think he's a policeman back there? Yes, he's a Just take a look on his face. Um, he's disgusted by the fact that Roy is, is leaving the country. I, I don't even think he knew that I was with Roy. He was just disgusted that a young woman was walking into the airport. That's how bad it is. When we were in the airport, um, you know, you can, I, Roya translated some of this for me, but maybe you can tell the story better. In this very lounge, um, when it was obvious that Roya was with us, we were sort of sitting, Michael and I, across from her in the seats. A, a police officer who patrolled the airport, who I'd met oddly enough some weeks earlier on a previous trip because I, I, my phone was dead and the, the flight I thought it was catching wasn't flying that day, and he gave me a lift to the gate. And this guy saw me with Roy and came up, not in a friendly manner at all, and said, you know, friend, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist, don't you remember? And he said, yeah, but, but why are you with her? Um, and I explained that she was going to school in Canada. He didn't buy it for a second. And so what did he say to you? It was really hard for her to believe that I'm leaving a country with two four young men and in this age while I was like young and he was like, how can you leave the country with like uh, two four young men and like there's lots of rules and such. like I can't blame him because he was like, you know, he grew up in same kind of situation and he know the situation there and it was really hard for him to to see an Afghan girl like to go to free men to travel for education. And she never believed that I will go for education and get the away where I explained that I'm going, I'm leaving Kandahar, but will you, one day you will see, like I will come with lots of proud for Afghans. It's, it doesn't mean I'm leaving country as a, someone to go and just leave the country. It can be a great future like for all our Afghans. And, he never trusted me by saying this. He thought maybe something wrong. That's why I'm leaving with this two foreign men. And it was really difficult time because I had a conversation with this police officer for two hours, like after I left. And he was like, "How did your family allow you? How you gonna leave country without like in this age and all this stuff?" So I explained. At the end, while I was like what's his problem, like I have to figure out, like I have to find a way, and it was a big shame that a uh, foreign journalist come like to bring uh, something different in Afghanistan and they will get shot or caught or something, I was really afraid of that, and I just asked them, you guys stay away, I can deal with him, he's our own Afghan, I can deal the way he's like, he is, 
Then I figured out that he came from really hard circumstances, you know. He is a police officer that have responsibility of a family, uh, that his family was back home in Kabul, and he was working for all this uh, family. It was really hard for him, and he told me that uh, as suddenly he was really intelligent man, perfect speaking, and he was speaking really good English, and as well Pashto and Dari, like really great Afghan police officer, and I was like, he was like, I was afraid that how can you leave, how your family allowed? And I was like, I explained all the situation and then I figured out that he have, has own pain, that he lost father the same way and he don't have a good job to support the family and all these troubles. And I had some friends, I said, you know, you can give, you just can give me like your email address or something, I can exchange contact and find a job for you. I had a friend and organization, suddenly I called to her and I said, would you like a person to work with you? And they said, yes, but well, you work, but you can't work, <laughs> you're leaving. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not gonna work now, I'm leaving. And just, I, a friend, I just say a friend of mine, just to control the situation and to make him cool down and everything is all right, that I can leave the airport. I just changed the contact and then uh, he just, okay, at the end when I was leaving, and he was like, just, do you want me to transfer your luggage? I said, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, she, she, the way Roya tells it, it's not as scary as it was at the moment. I was, as this was going on, I was whispering to Michael, uh, you know, if, if he tries to stop us, because he had said, you're not getting on the airplane. You're not gonna leave this airport. And I said to Michael, you know, what are we gonna do? You know, if, if we get to the doorway and he grabs her, then we've got to stay with her. We got to grab her back or something. I was—I didn't know what the, was going to happen. Um, meanwhile, Roya is is massaging this guy and figuring out figuring out you know what he what he needed. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, meta metaphorically. What? I can't understand that. <laughs> um, you see, you see the problems I cause. <laughs> I was like, I never did it, so. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, the short, the short end of the story, the short part of the story is she knew more of what she was doing than I did. At that moment, I knew that we had done the right thing. You know, Roy is not just someone who dreams of, of being a politician, she's born to be a politician. She knows how to, how to work people and get things done. When it's, when, you know, not, massage them necessarily, <laughs> but, but, you know, how to, how to get things done. Um, you know, this, <laughs> this, this is Roya on the, on the, on the flight to Dubai and then in Dubai. You know, the, just remember a few frames before this, she was in the dust in a burqa at her father's gravesite, and then literally hours later, she's uh, in, you know, Dubai duty free. You can imagine the culture shock. Um, I remember being next to Roy on the airplane, and there's, an, you know, it's Emirates Airlines, so they got a great entertainment system, and there were movies, and I thought, you know, there's got to be a movie in there that's that's not dangerous to watch, and and Mary Poppins was there, <laughs> and I, I showed Roy to, to get the whole thing down to Mary Poppins, and she said no, she didn't want to watch it, didn't didn't want to watch any television. Well, I think now you watch television. Right. I always do, but it was hard situation that I can't focus on television. <laughs> I had enough terrible trouble to focus on some. May I recommend Mary Poppins if you haven't seen it? <laughs> um, then, you know, there, there's Raya at uh, at Pearson Airport, and and just just so you know that that it's not just men in Kandahar who thought something was weird about all this. When we finally got to the immigration counter. I stepped forward with Roy and Michael and I introduced myself and I told the immigration officer who I was and that I was escorting this young woman um, to school in, at Ashbury College in Ottawa. And he looked at me and said, why does she need an escort? <laughs> and he, he, he thought, this doesn't sound right. Um, and then he, he typed into the computer and he started reading aloud from the text, I guess they put a file in there and he started, he was skeptical, 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 and then he got to the part about Roy's father. It's in the file. And he read it, and his whole demeanor changed, and it was like, welcome to Canada. So, you know, when, 
when people hear the whole thing, I think people get it, what, what this is all about. It's not just about one person, although it's largely about one person. It's about a greater idea. And, you know, as a journalist, when you, when you because I, you know, we can get into this in the questions, I hope. I'm still criticized by colleagues for, for getting involved in this. And, you know, it's, uh, it's easier to walk away. Nobody would have faulted me for just saying, well, that's life, it's not my business. And it would have been simpler because, um, you know, now, now I'm, part of, I'm part of something I can't control and shouldn't control, but it keeps me awake at night, wondering what might go wrong and, and you know, all the, all the things a parent worries about. Um, all of those are good things, but they're, they're sometimes painful. And that, you know, any parent will tell you it's easier not to have kids, but you're glad in, in the end that you did. It would have been easier just to say no, but I'm glad I didn't. Because to watch Roya grow to where she is today, only, a, you know, just over a year later, what I thought she was capable of is just a tiny bit of what she's capable of. And 10 years from now, maybe we could all get together and, uh, and celebrate where, where she is then. Um, this, this is Roy getting off the train um, on her way to Ashbury. Uh, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't choose this, but there she was in front of the poster of Aung San Suu Kyi, who you'll know is the, the, you know, not so long ago released from house arrest Democratic leader of, um, of Burma. Um, you, you know, the, some of you will know her story, but she, she won a democratic election, and the military junta didn't like that and put her under house arrest, and she has suffered terribly uh, and finally was released under international pressure, but still isn't the leader of the country. She won an election, but because she's a pragmatic woman who knows that she can't defeat the military, and she could lead an uprising maybe with people in the streets, but that would only get a lot of people killed. She has chosen for pra pragmatic reasons to just be a member of parliament and hope that she can change the system that way. And this is a conversation Roy and I were having this afternoon. You know, how, how do you change the system? Do you, do you stand up and lead people into the streets if it's gonna be a violent uprising? Or do you try to change it within the system? Do you try to change minds? And these are all things that, you know, that uh, that Roya is going to decide for herself, and others, you know, other countrymen, women, will decide for themselves. How do they fix what's wrong with Afghanistan? And I, for one, am, am going to be fascinated to watch it unfold. That's then and now. Uh, you know, because, just a quick pitch, because there's a charitable element to this, uh, Ashbury has been generous beyond belief in allowing Roy to go there uh, without paying school fees, living in the residence without living, uh, paying the fees for that. It's extraordinarily expensive, um, but we ask when we can people to donate um, to support other living expenses, other related expenses. Um, and if you're interested, just send me an email at that address. We'll leave it up, I hope, and I'll tell you how to do that. Thank you for your attention. And I took too much of Roya's time. Now, now it's yours. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. and Professor Thomas for having me here and inviting me here. And uh, I would like to thank all the all audience for coming and for this great opportunity that all Canadians joined me in this journey. So that's all that uh, Mr. Paul mentioned, as you're all aware of how we met and how we got till here. So as I told before, that it was one of my dreams to be a politician in Afghanistan circumstance, but the circumstance and situation changed while I lost my father. So I get to Canada after like uh, 2012, uh, in 2012 while I arrived to Canada. <laughs> So it was the first experience being in a white land, which I thought, now I'm reading Giver. So I thought Canada is also the same as uh, there is no dream, no color. <laughs> because first 
because when I came, it was all white about the snow uh, while alive. And now that I'm reading The Giver, I'm saying, uh, oh, maybe Canada was the same, that there was no color and no, <laughs> no pain, but uh, probably it's a lot of, uh, we can get sunshine and grass and everything, so that's all right. It's fine with me now, not, not one year before. <laughs> And uh, so now that I get to, uh, I really appreciate Ashbury that I have now the opportunity to study here. So no one predicts the situation how like going to be like 10 year later so that I can see a dream like to be a politician and run back my country and help my uh, country that have like lots of pain on it and many people come and go through the situation. No one had the idea to change Afghanistan and do something that stands for what an Afghan wants. Like, it's true that all people helped us through all, but we need some educated and standard, and we need basic that we can run, like we can have Afghanistan as a better place, which is our new generation with good education facilities, with a, like having a good education and trained well people that have a good leaders for Afghanistan, just not by saying that I'm a leader and I want to run a country. It doesn't make like change. We have to stand and say, I'm ready for every sac sacrifice to do for my country. To make change for Afghanistan, to make change for those people who lost all their members of family. Just not me, it's, I'm, it's pain for me that I lost my father. At the same time, it's pain for those people who lost like their all family. And I really like, I'm really, like, I can't say how to say, but I really can understand Canadians too, that they lost the troops and forces in Canada and Afghanistan. In a mission, they lost like legs, hands, which is really hard to send from a safe place, someone to a country, which is no, it's always going work well because they have a good humanity and they can help and they are seeing the world that it should be see, like they want Afghanistan to stand back. So now that uh, I can see the situation not back home is really good to move on for a, any reaction and stand for, but I can see like maybe we will have Afghanistan 10 years later as a country that a woman and men can spend 1550 rights for every man and women to get education, to work together and say, yes, we are overworked, we want just peaceful Afghanistan, but same as other countries that country's journey, I read about World War I and World War II, which is really surprising, but I would get my history teacher is here. If I'm wrong, uh, <laughs> I need you to correct me, but you know that I'm not good with this, so. <laughs> I read about that, like about Germany and everywhere, and so it's over the war, but Afghanistan war takes care. Why it's not coming to the mind of these people who spend billions of dollars and there is no change in Afghanistan. Even we don't like have a school that our children can go and get basic education. We have some, but I don't say that we don't. And the situation is really hard. Some parents, like my parents, can be tough. Can be so nice that I am today here. But they can let their children to go and get education. Some, because of the situation and security, they can't leave their children to go and get education. And that meanwhile, when my parents always allow me, you know, it was like a demonstration and demonstration got to violence and we had school burn. And I got, I got injured a little bit slightly on my arm, but the next day I asked my father, that can I stay home? And my father was like, you know, your tongue is not burned, you can go, you can write with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which, which we Afghans need that. Which we really need that to, our parents let us to go in and see the society. And we have to, we are Afghans, we are the basic, like as Mr. Paul said, like we are not allowing European to like come and be involved in a care, like foreign countries, uh, decision what they are making for their country and how they will run their country. So Afghans are the same. We want to run our country by our own. And what we need to run our country by our own and what we need to have is educated people that can understand the situation, that have a 
knowledge and skill, just not graduate of grade 12 and going to parliament. That's not gonna work. It's again the same situation as, this, as we had before, 10, 50 years before. So we still, hopefully, we will get there and the journey we will see through, like I really appreciate that all Canadian health and especially I would take, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Toronto Star and especially Mr. Paul and Michael Cook and all Canadians that joined me in this journey and we will see what will happen in the next 10 years. Hopefully one day I will have speech and I will say, yeah, Afghanistan is not anymore a war country <laughs> and there is no violence anymore and we can see Afghanistan as a future, not just not as a warland. We don't want any more warlords. We need pen. We will put our guns down. As I had a picture for Women's Strength Day with our school nurse that I choose to say, oh, not any more weapon. I don't want to take weapon in my hand to fight for Afghans. I have only pen to fight for my Afghans. And all Afghans love that pen, and hopefully we will get by this pen the way we want, and Afghanistan will be a successful country. Thank you. So we have time for some questions, so I'm gonna show you how it's done. You come up here, there's a microphone. You can introduce yourself if you wish, or just uh, pose a question. So while people make their decisions about doing so, why don't I just quickly ask each of you a question. Uh, I'd like to know how this relationship has changed you. So for Paul, you know, is the journalism of engagement like uh, dual citizenship or having two passports? So can you sort of go to Afghanistan and do it this way, uh, but then you go to Syria and Aleppo? It, is it a different kind of journalism? Are you gonna switch back and forth or is this like now the way you're gonna do it? And Roya, when you go back, uh, how do you see yourself as a different person? What, what kind of person is gonna go back to Afghanistan? How, how might you see yourself being different from the person who came here? Who's going first? <laughs> you decide. Um, I, I shall quickly demonstrate the value of a Carleton University Journalism School education. <laughs> the, one of the things I remember clearest about our lectures the, was the point, uh, correct me if I got this one wrong, um, that as journalism developed from the, the period of yellow journalism, when there was a period of crusading and journalists had a point of view and that model worked, as journalism became, uh, as ad more advertisers came into newspapers, they were worried about that sort of activist crusading journalism because they might turn off a portion of their potential uh, customers. So things, the so-called objective journalism developed so that we could make advertisers feel comfortable and, and have pretty well anyone with any point of view finding a way into our news coverage. So when you know that brief history, you know that this sacred principle of so-called journalistic objectivity is not written in, in stone anywhere. It was something that developed perhaps primarily for financial reasons. Here we are today, uh, uh, you know, if you haven't heard this on the news, two days ago, the Toronto Star announced it's gonna lay off at least 55 people, maybe 60. In, you know, after so many years of layoffs, that's a huge number of people. They wanna cut six and a half million dollars out of their, their uh, payroll very, very quick. Um, the people they're getting rid of are copy editors, people who lay off pages, they're basically rapidly reducing the newsroom to just reporting staff and a, you know, a few dumb editors to make the place look realistic. But you know, people who do the hard work of, of copy editing and finding mistakes and those sorts of things, that's gonna be contracted out. Now, um, a lot of, because of the financial problems, and they're severe for newspapers across the you know, English, you know, around the world primarily, um, people are asking, well, you know, is, is the solution technology? Do we just have to tweet more? Or do we update our Facebook pages more? Um, 
is the, is the solution this or that? When I ask that question, I believe that what is old is new again. The Toronto Star, throughout all of its history, has had a very proud tradition of crusading for certain things. It crusaded for the poor when, you know, when Toronto had, had street children, you know, by the thousands living in the street. They would write about how this was wrong and unchristian and all those sorts of things. Um, so it's not so unusual for a Toronto Star reporter to do what I did. But I think that, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, I think the public craves this sort of thing because they are tired of being told about problems without being offered a solution. And because of, partly because of that, not just because of the internet in it as a technological revolution, but because they can go to other non-mainstream websites and get involved and try to solve the problems that they know about, they're going in droves. And what I tell my colleagues, and, and you know, understand there are, there are numerous people who think that what, my attitude is wrong, that it's dangerous, and that if we blow up objectivity that we'll lose all sorts of credibility, and all of those things we can discuss. What I say to them is, no, you're, you're absolutely wrong. Our, our so-called objectivity, A, is unrealistic. We're human beings. We have a point of view. And the public gave up on that a long time ago. Now, the, uh, Alan asked the, the key question. You cannot be an activist journalist 24 hours a day. Uh, I don't know everything. I'm not God. But, but when there's a moment like this, when I can see the difference between right and wrong, I think the public accepts that I will make a choice and say, I think this is the right thing. And if you want to come with me, come with me. So the pages won't be filled all the time with subjective, you know, I know what I'm talking about, I'm right, journalism, but I think there should be more of it. I think the public wants it, and I think, I think it will draw more readers back to us. So to can turn it mine, I would like to say, like, if I uh, will go back uh, to the situation and I got the opportunity to go back to my country, I will be not a diff totally different person. I am Afghan, and I'm proud who I am. And what makes me proud that I have now, like, the opportunity to get education and the opportunity that I have today, I can provide this opportunity for even at least 10 other people who need this opportunity to get education. And we all, like, we need to have someone to have, it, uh, have a high skill and run this country. And probably, I'm not going to say that I will be especially Prime Minister when I get there, but I, at least I can change some minds for them and I can say what's right, what's wrong. And if we get these people together and they can understand what the circumstances, why we are behind, why Afghans are behind, why everyone is saying, you know, every news is writing Afghans every day, 20 Afghans dead. Because we don't have our own Afghan community. It's like everyone is running us. We need this Afghan community. If I will go back, first of all, I will get lots of women to, to come together and say, yes, we have our voice. We are not silent. We never can give up. If we didn't, and Af if Afghans didn't give up in this 34 years of war, they will never give up. I'm, I'm sure about that. And if I will, if the, I get opportunity that uh, it's not looking to me like to kill me in a one month, probably, <laughs> I will, I will do the change that I promise to everyone and my family and all Afghans that I promise that I'm going to Canada, but I will be back with lots of things and I will have be at, at least a little change for society. The, can I quickly say, Roy reminded me of something important. Uh, the, I fought myself for this. Journalists have taken the burqa, the full, you know, full length veil, and turned it into a symbol of oppression of women. And uh, not through any intention, I don't think, that has come to suggest that Afghan women are weak and timid and oppressed. You can see that's not the case here, but I assure you, if you go into any Afghan home, talk to any Afghan man, they will tell you Afghan women are not timid. Um, run, sure. I would like to explain, expand on that, that like burqa, first of all, we are Muslim, we do, hij we do hijab, but burqa is not our weakness. 
it's just the culture that left for Afghans. We have hijab, we are Muslim, we do hijab like the scarf and no hair shown probably with the scarf, but we don't have burqa. Burqa is just left from the culture for us. It's not the main basic of Islam, the things. And it's not our, our weakness, it's our strength. Because situation back home is in Afghanistan, it's not safe. If I will walk two days the, the same time I walk like now here, I can get shot. It, everything is possible to happen. Because of the circumstances and situation back home, women are supposed to work. But if you see, we should not see their burqa and their, how they are, the way of style. It doesn't make sense like to see, to judge them from their, wearing their burqa. Judge them from their mind. Go ask any Afghan female or male that's well educated, that belongs to a family, not just to go and ask someone in the street. They have the ability to be a good people in the future. People judge us as we are wearing burqa. It's not the same. If I wear a suit, I'm a best person that I can do everything. No. If I want, people should not wear, judge me by my burqa. People should judge me by my power and by what I have the ability. It's just that through this 24 years that's left that we have to wear a burqa just because of safety in the situation, the facilities that we don't have it there, we are wearing burqa. But see, judge people what they have inside. Don't judge people what you can see in Afghans. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks very much for the talk. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to ask one quick question and then sort of a longer question. First of all, with the Afghan Canadian Community Center, do you, either of you have a sense of what its future is right now? Because my understanding, partly from what Paul's written before, is that CETA was cutting funding for it and it was kind of in a struggle to figure out how it was going to replace that funding. But this, and the second question I had was, um, Roy, I was really curious to know, since you've been here and talked to Canadians, how do you think Canadians really, having had soldiers there for 10 years and, and um, um, lots of also, you know, politicians and human rights focus on it. Um, do you think Canadians really still have, the, in general, have an understanding of Afghanistan and what, when you talk to them about it, have an understanding of what it's like there? And what would you really like people to know that they, because I'm assuming, what would you like to have people know that they don't know right now, I guess? Is Thank you. I would you like to say that, like, we, are, we really appreciate all Afghans, the loss of soldiers in, Af in Afghanistan. As I said before, that it's really hard for my Afghan that I lost my father. For my own country, that's a really big pain. But think that you send your child or your husband, your father, to a country, from a country which is safe and sending for dead. It's like, for sure, you know. Maybe he will come back, maybe he will never come back. But I would like to say Canadians should understand that Afghans really appreciate that. And the situation that Canadians go through for Afghanistan, it is really hard. It is really hard to have your child or your father, your husband, send and never get back to come. The understanding they should understand that when we circumstances, they are leaving in Afghanistan. Which missions they are doing with our, with our soldiers which is a really, 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 really difficult situation. And Afghans really appreciate that. But nothing we can do for that. We are sorry. Because we are losing like in a day, 120, 140 people. Which is, for Afghan, it's like, it's really hard for a family, for a country that like 120 people, everyone have a sorrow and pain in their home. We feel that pain with Canadians too. We can understand then how hard it is to send someone from your home and never get back. I would like to all Canadians know and feel the pain of those parents, those mothers that lost their child for Afghanistan. I'm feeling very really sorry for that. I want to tell a very quick story, um, which I hope will show you how, how much of a failure journalism is generally in a country as complicated as Afghanistan. You know, we, I, I and all of my colleagues, I think, do our hardest to try to, to 
get to know and understand and sort it out. But you know, just read any history of Afghanistan and any foreigner will tell you the same thing. As, as military commanders are leaving now, with all the intelligence gathering operations and everything else that they have, they will admit to you that they, the more they know, the less they understand. It's an incredibly complicated place. About two days before Kabul fell to the, you know, to the Northern Alliance forces in 2001, after the U.S. sent in special forces to support them with bombing uh, to drive the Taliban out, about two days before they took Kabul, I was in the mountains, uh, you know, overlooking, the, you know, to a distance overlooking the city, and we'd gone up there for two or three days in a row, uh, and had sort of befriended a Northern Alliance commander. And the final time I went up there on this day, he was, you know, the first time we went up there, they were firing with anti-aircraft guns leveled horizontal to the ground and firing anti-aircraft guns down the road at Taliban fighters not far away. And this time when we went up, the Taliban were advancing up the road, not, not in anger, but they had come over to the Northern Alliance side. And the commander was riding along on horseback with another man beside him on horseback, and I was running along with my little uh, tape recorder trying to get one breath of air. Uh, and he was they were headed off to Kabul to join the advancing forces about to take the city. And I was asking the obvious question, but commander, to, you know, just yesterday, you were firing anti-aircraft guns leveled to the ground at these people. Uh, what happened? And he stopped just long enough to tell me this. He said, I have known this man, the Taliban, local Taliban commander, since I was a boy, he was my brother's best friend. And he used to come to my house and I would, when I was younger, would play at their feet. He said, I've been communicating secretly by letter with him for years. And he was just waiting for the right moment to come over. And you know, that, that story just runs over and over in my head to this day. If if we had known just that one fact of Afghan society, that that enemies are brothers, and that alliances shift with the winds, that people are always calculating which way is this going, where, where do my interests lie, and that it's a very complicated game of chess, and that what we see as enemies, you know, the same letter from the major, we don't need to understand these people. Well, yes, we do need to understand them, because maybe you don't have to kill them. Maybe you could just do a deal with somebody, and they'll come over, and then other people will come over, and before you know it, the war is over, if we understood them. What I learned at that moment was if we had, you know, maybe it just took a few suitcases full of cash, maybe the Twin Towers would still be standing, and maybe Osama bin Laden would have been a footnote in history. But we ignored Afghanistan and didn't try to understand it, and as a journalist, I feel guilty of that because, you know, a lot of what we do is is based on stereotypes. The burqa is the biggest stereotype running. Um, it's a great challenge to try to understand complex places and get past the sort of sports metaphor of war. The sad fact is that TV networks like war, newspapers like it to a lesser extent, but they also like it because it's easy to cover. It's good versus bad, dark, you know, black versus white, good versus evil, and it doesn't take a lot of thought to cover it. To cover things so that they don't get to a war, to cover the diplomacy and the intricate negotiations and the understandings that can avert war, that's impossibly difficult, and journalism does a terrible job of it. Um, the Afghan Canadian Community Center the Americans stepped in, ironically enough, to fund the Afghan Canadian Community Center when CETA pulled its money out. But private Canadians, I'm glad to say, continue to contribute through the Canadian International Learning Foundation, which is an Ottawa-based charity. So it's still, um, you know, still the Afghan Canadian Community Center, part of it, um, largely funded by American tax dollars, but also good Canadian donations. Uh, we have to space until about 9 o'clock, and then we have to turn it back into a Tim Hortons. <laughs> so, uh, could I just see, I, I think a few people want to ask questions, so why don't you approach the mic so that I know you want to ask questions, and we may just hear your questions, and then okay. turn it over to you guys to, uh, to go from there. So 
why don't we sort of canvas the questions and then we can uh, carry on from there. Okay, my first question is directed to Paul. So, do you feel your role as a journalist has changed since covering the story because you chose to get involved? And my next question is to Roya, and it's uh, yes. when you're a politician, what's the first thing you want to do for your country? Second is corruption, which is going over all Afghanistan. Third, the right of speech, which I learned from my history teacher. He's here, and anyway. But I know before. <laughs> and, and the right of speech, that every human have freedom to talk about. Like now, we, can't, we don't have this right to talk. We have like people who have power, they can just do what they want. Our poor educated that spend all their life to study, they can't get to the stage where they want to serve the country. It's all about corruption. What makes country to increase and don't have development, that is what? It is corruption and no equality of men and women. We have in our office hundreds of men, but no women, which I was the life example when I was, I did some crazy works. So when I was like 15, 16, uh, yes, when I father was alive, in three months, I thought I know some English. My tutors here, yeah. So, I, I thought I know some English, and I applied for a job, which is an organization with 1,000 men and a girl that's only 16 and going to job every day, which is really pretty dangerous. And my parents were like, it's enough that you're going to teach people if you don't know anything, but at least you know something to teach, but don't do it, it's so dangerous. But I realized if I don't step out, no women will get this power and say that I can do it. Why? If a man can go and have, like, they have the same brain, they have eating the same way, they are going out, why? I can't do that. So I step in and I just go to the office for an interview and they were like, first their question was, how old are you? I was like, yeah, I'm 16, but I want to get a job. That's not a big deal. See, Am I have the ability to get this job or not? Or maybe there will be a male that can get my position. I was like, no, I don't want to do it. As you saw the picture with the high only, like I was covered, I worked all the day. I was admin assistant, <laughs> which my math is not good. But anyway, I was doing filing. So <laughs> not a huge job, but it was fine for the time. So I got step in and I was like, other, uh, after interview, I was coming every day and there's two highs and looking, staring in a computer, don't look to men. No, not at all. Uh, just look to your screen of computer and do your work. Till I get to lunch. In lunchtime, I have to, all the men should go and eat together. I was alone in a spare room that I can open the cover and eat. So why a man can eat in a public and a woman should be covered all the time that even can have a glass of water till they get to a spare room. What makes the men different from us? What, does, what ability they have with, that we don't have it? Let's think about it. Like in a here, people have voice. We don't have voice there. If I was stand and say, probably they're saying, you are crazy. But I'm not. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe a little bit crazy, that's fine. <laughs> so, it's the big change for Afghan women and Afghan community to have equal rights, and they can do it. Thank you. Okay, we have three, we have three more people, so why don't we just quickly get your questions, and then we'll... Uh, it's just a quick question for Roya. Um, it seems that... Um, Things aren't going to things aren't going to get um, all that much easier for women in Afghanistan in the next few years. The Taliban probably will come back in a, in a resurgent way. So, just wondering for you, do you have any other than your father? Do you sort of look up to, to any women in Afghanistan? Does somebody like Manali Joya, for example, um, is, is she like an example for you? Maybe somewhere you you hope for hope. Uh, 
Yes, this is a great question, but uh, the only inspiration woman that was, I read about, but I never met it, she passed away, so it was Malala Maiwendi, who was the time that we are going to lose the war and all our men were died. And some men that left probably injured. So she woke up and said, stand up and said, we, we can do it, let's go for it. After that, the uh, women came out, the men, injured men stand up and say, if our women can do that, we can do that. So here is the point that I'm saying, equality, inequality, inequality. We got a stone and stick, our all women run and fight the enemy. And that was a great inspiration for me to read about. Right, that just you know, for those who don't know, that's during the British period, you know, the occupation. This, uh, this, and she was a Pashtun woman, wasn't she? She was a Pashtun woman, yeah. It's like the Joan of Arc of Afghanistan. The, the battle was being lost, they were being massacred, and she stood up and said, you know, get back out there and fight, a woman led. So this is not an unusual thing. Af Afghan men should be reminded of that frequently. They have to remind it, but they think they don't hear. <laughs> so I have to whisper to everyone's hair that, you know, we got the country for you, don't wait. <laughs> Um, my question's for Paul. Um, as I'm standing up here, I'm hearing you answer my question a little bit already. Um, I've heard you speak about before about um, development journalism. Um, I've also tonight heard you speak about activist journalism. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role um, of the media in peace building, if you can talk a little bit about that. You started to answer it when you were talking about um, the analogy with sports. Um, what's the role of the media in peace building? How should it look? The, you know, I'm gonna focus in because we're, the time is short and also because I believe very passionately about this. The, you know, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy nut, but here goes. There, there are forces at work in the world that, that get very little attention. There are people, journalists, who know about them. Um, you know, Alan and I were speaking earlier about the situation in Syria. The, the CIA um, meets openly with opposition forces um, in a place called Gaziantep in southern Turkey. There's a, a, only one five-star hotel there. So you can see them coming and going. And when, when there happened to be a lot of American and Syrians having breakfast in a five-star hotel in Turkey, it doesn't take a genius to figure out something's up. And you just go to the ballroom, and there they are with the maps out, and they're having meetings. Um, if the CIA is there, then the Mossad Assad's there, then Saudi intelligence is there. There, there are foreign intelligence agencies pulling levers in Syria, and people are dying. They're trying to save lives, but they're also making the situation complicated. And what I dream of is the day when journalists can get that story out so that we in democracies can say, hold on a second here. Um, is that such a smart idea? You know, backing this faction over that. And, and that sort of journalism, rather than the, you know, the unfortunately, uh, a, a school got bombed today. That's important, and it's important to get people to care, and people generally care when children suffer. But the more important journalism is the investigative journalism that will tell you all of the dirty things that, that are being done in our name that are leading to large numbers of people getting killed. And it's very complicated, and I don't know how we get there, but the, the web is certainly better at this than mainstream newspapers are. If you're interested in that sort of thing, you can find it. The difficulty is figuring out who the conspiracy nuts are and who the well-informed people are. But if the New York Times, the credible you know, media institutions in the world, really went hard after that stuff, I think we'd all be a lot better off. Uh, this question is for Paul. I was just wondering Having spent most of my, my career um, in living in foreign bureaus, I'm of two minds about this. Because I can tell you quite honestly that you get into a rut when you live in one place. You can get lazy and things that you just say, well, that's not new, that's not new, because you live there. You, you, you see the stuff all the time, but the reporter who gets off the plane sees it all fresh. So that's one 
bad part of living in, in one place and covering a region all the time. You quickly get, can get stale. The good part is the obvious part. You, you have better sources and you, you have a much deeper understanding of it. Um, the simple answer is newspapers, and this isn't just Canadian newspapers, this is newspapers the world over, just can't afford that kind of stuff anymore. You know, the, when I started out as a foreign correspondent, when I, when I got fired by the LA Times, uh, I was billing them for, you know, for, for an international school for my son because they, I couldn't put my son in a, in a local school in New Delhi because they have, they have no windows and the teachers don't show up. So I have to put him in an international school and they charge huge amounts of money, much, much more than Ashbury does. In, in some countries where we had foreign correspondents, they had to sign, I forget what it's called, but it's like a thousand dollar, a hundred thousand dollar guarantee that, that you know they're gonna be enrolled for four years and you're gonna get your hundred thousand dollars. And if I leave early because of earthquake or a disaster or something, we'll still give you the hundred thousand dollars. The, the expenses add up very quickly, you very rapidly get into the millions of dollars, and that just is impossible anymore. Nobody can play that game anymore. So the question to me now is, how do you try to do it well under the restraints that we have? Um, the, the only answer I have for that is to try to, to have sort of tiers of expertise. It's like, it's like the Leafs, the Leafs will never win the Stanley Cup again until they rebuild their farm system. The Toronto Star as an example has a rather weak foreign correspondent farm system because no one can aspire to a full-time position in it anymore. So when I learned how to be a war correspondent, I mean there are certain things that you have to learn, there are instincts that you develop, you start to get a, you know, I don't want to sound invincible because I'm not, but you start to get a sixth sense about what road looks safe and which one doesn't. And you only learn those things by getting out there and risking, you know, taking small steps of risk to bigger steps of risk. And we don't have that farm system in Canada anymore. So the, to me, the, the big question is how do you start giving people a chance to learn those things? Because, you know, another, another element of this is insurance. Toronto start to send me to Syria for a week. They don't tell me how much they spend, but I can feel the pain in their voice. It's a large sum of money. Um, so newspapers broadcast more and more, tend to either just take the free stuff off of YouTube. You know, the New York Times is a fascinating and valuable thing on their website called watching, watching the war in Syria or something. It's just somebody who monitors YouTube and tries to make sense of it. Um, that, you know, it's great, it's a nice little niche, but it's not gonna save the world. The, the unfortunate trend is that freelancers who don't have insurance, uh, and several of them are either dead or in captivity, we don't know, in Syria as we speak, they're taking much greater, a much greater burden than they ever have. Profit-making corporations are making money off the backs of uninsured, risk-taking freelancers. And you know, thank God for them, but the, there has to be a better way to, as I say, develop a farm system, give people some protection, some, some backing as, as something other than a freelancer with his neck way out on the line. invite both of you if you wanted to say anything briefly in, uh, in closing before we end this evening. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by the number of seats that were full tonight. I, I tend to worry that people are shutting off. Um, you know, I'm a taxpayer. I've got a kid. I've got a mortgage. I live in Vancouver. Imagine the pain that I suffer. I have all, all the problems that everyone else has, but I still care about the world. And I fear that, that more, as people have more things to worry about in their personal lives, they have few, fewer reasons to care about the world. And it gives me great strength to see that there are, you know, for every one of you, you represent many, many hundreds more. As a journalist, I feel compelled to find a way to, to help you care more about it and to give you a way to change it. 
So I'm really surprised and I'm really happy to have everyone here. Hopefully you enjoyed and not get bored. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Hopefully we will see again. And as Mr. Paul said, we are like, I, I don't expect how many people are there. All seats are full and there is back people. That's really making me happy. Thank you so much. So I, just, I want to thank both of you for coming here. You've both come a long way, uh, metaphorically and geographically. <laughs> and thanks for taking us on your journey. Uh, although I think you're already there, actually. But I guess journeys continue even when you already oh, yes. get. Believe me, this has got a long way to go. I want to remind people, uh, Paul's email, star emails are easy to remember. It's pwatson at thestar.ca. So if you want to follow up, if you want to get involved, uh, want to continue being involved, join the family, uh, get in touch with Paul. And I want to remind you, uh, not in this space, but in another space on campus in a couple of weeks, and Paul was instrumental in helping with this as well. We have a journalist from Syria uh, who's going to be in Canada. Uh, Yasser El Haji, who Paul met, uh, who works there, who's going to come and share with us about how do you do journalism in uh, in Syria these days? And we hope he's going to talk about some of those skeletons in those dark closets. He knows a lot. So watch for uh, more information about that. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Tim uh, Horton, for letting us use your space, <laughs> and uh, thanks to all the students who helped to turn this into a. Uh, theater for this uh, for this event, and we do record these events now at Carleton. There's an on the record team. I think that's what you're called. I think so. uh, OTR on the record. They're there, and we'll uh, pop this up on YouTube. So just check the School of Journalism website now and then to be able to go back and and look at this again and share it with other people. So thank you again very much. Good night.